Good evening and welcome to Course in Miracles, workbook for students. We now have just completed the introduction to workbook part two. What we'll do next is the Course in Miracles, the primary lesson of understanding before the meditation that comes through as the daily lessons, which then we embark on as of today. And so the question is asked, what is forgiveness? Now, forgiveness, as explained many a time in the course, is very often mistaken. And what is assumed to be forgiveness is really false forgiveness. And that is, in, we take a position of, of grandiosity. I'm holy, I'm special, I'm spiritual, whatever the case may be. You've done me wrong or you've done wrong, but I forgive you because I'm holy. I see the sin and I forgive you because I'm holy. Very often what happens in this world is people hurt each other, abandon each other, lie to each other, cheat, um, insult each other. And the typical narcissistic behavior, of course, a narcissist, especially if they're a spiritual narcissist, will never admit that they're wrong. And it comes back to that old thing, that old saying, would you rather be happy or would you be right? Now, the narcissist needs to be right, even if it means ending a friendship or you know, making you feel responsible for their behavior. A narcissist will apologize for having hurt you, abandoned you, rejected you, physically harmed you, insulted you, and then will tell you that it's your behavior that caused them to do that. They'll take no responsibility for the behavior. And because they're spiritual, a narcissist will actually go and find a type of teacher that will spew forth what they agreed to, and then send that to you to convince you that you are wrong. To forgive is to forget. If you've forgiven someone and they refuse to change their behavior, if they refuse to attack you, insult you, um, abandon you or cheat on you and lie to you and continually choose to hurt you, it doesn't mean that you haven't forgiven. If you've let it go and you've now let it go completely that it no longer affects you, but they continue to attack you. Are you going to stand there and, and, continue, and allow yourself to continuously be abused? The jihad, the holy war, is to say, this is God's sovereignty. I give the authority only to God. I do not give authority to an, a fractured aspect of myself to keep attacking this. Because if I allow this to keep being attacked, then I must somehow be attached to being the victim, to being attacked, to being abused, to being insulted. Where two are gathered in my name, where two people are fully willing to let go and let God, both will be healed. Both the person doing the forgiveness and the forgiven. They both are forgiven instantaneously because to give is to have. And you can only give but to yourself. If your fractured self refuses to accept the forgiveness which has given us all, and sometimes what you need to do is close that chapter, walk away and say, I forgive you. And in time, you will forget that experience because you've truly forgiven it. To forgive is to forget. Forgiveness recognizes that what you thought your brother did has not occurred. It doesn't mean you allow them to keep attacking you. It doesn't pardon sins and make them real. It sees there was no sin. And in that view, are all your sins forgiven? And if your sins are forgiven and the other appearance of a character doesn't want to stop its attack behavior, you forgive, you forget, you walk away, you let it rest because you no longer need attack thoughts or the appearance of attack thoughts in physical form. And this is important. You're not forgiving a sin. You realize that nothing happened. We're just dreaming. And in that, you recognize your sins are forgiven too because you've never done anything. What is sin except a false idea about God's son, about what you are? The extension of God. Extension of God, God's son. Forgiveness merely sees its falsity and therefore lets it go. To forgive is to forget. What then is free to take its place? is now the will of God. And if you move from an abusive relationship and you truly are loving, 
you'll find a fractured aspect of self coming back in the most loving way. But if you haven't forgiven yourself and truly are acting from a place of love, one person may leave, but you'll just have another one replace them, look completely different, act completely differently. But the experience of abuse or hurt or rejection will be the same. But once you're really done with that lesson, you say, I forgive you. You put it down and you move inwards, forwards to the new self. An unforgiven thought is one which makes a judgment that it will not raise to doubt, although it is not true. And that's typical of what we call sociopathic narcissistic behavior in the world. They refuse to admit to their attack thought behavior. And they refuse to look upon the reality of what is real, our true immortal reality, and what is the reality of the illusion, which is not real at all. No matter how real it seems in the illusion, none of it is. The mind is closed and will not be released if it's bought into the appearance, the what is. The thought protects the projection, tightening its chains so that distortions are more veiled and more uh, obscure less easily accessible to doubt and further kept from reason. And this is the whole psychology behind belief to reinforce, 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 gather the troops, gather the masses, and that we have enough people saying the same thing, then it must be true. Because how else can a lie be upheld other than getting others to agree? And then henceforth, you then need to formalize. It takes a huge amount of effort you build a institution with dogma and doctrines. And before you know it, you have a cult and it's what religion has become. And so have many a spiritual path, spiritual path. The way is simple. The way is no path. The way is inwards. The way is, is a, is a inward personal way. It doesn't require groups and acceptance and followers. It doesn't charge money for it. What can come between a fixed projection and the aim that it has chosen as its wanted goal? What can come between it? Only the falsity of desire, which only can only turn into disappointment because spirit expects nothing. Only ego expects and desires. An unforgiven thought does many things. In frantic action, it pursues its goal twisting and overturning what it sees as interfering with its chosen path. That's why many religions, they need to obliterate the enemy. Anyone that sees it differently either needs to be pulled in and made a member of kicking or screaming, converted to its doctrines or killed. We can't have anyone opposing it because if you have doubters on the outside, you're going to have doubters on the inside and we need everybody to have blind faith. Distortion is its purpose and the means by which it would accomplish it as well. And, and very quickly, because of the nature of belief, believers themselves will start doubting each one's point of view. And before you know it, you have fractions. It's what's happened to religion. It sets about its furious attempts to smash reality by creating fantasies which it needs to uphold by forcing you to believe it, by creating a fear as an alternative to you not believing. So if you don't believe in the hereafter and a God and the blood of Jesus, then you're going to hell to be cast out and burnt forever. And you start indoctrinating a child as soon as he can start to learn. And by the time he's reached his formative years, if the entire community around him thinks in the same way and he starts to doubt himself, he starts to question himself, he starts to think, is there something wrong with me? This is the way of the world. And oh, is that person's weird and he's strange and he's an outcast. Thank God for the outcasts with the courage to stand by their true convictions, to stand by that inner voice that calls them to be themselves knowingly. As it says, sets out its furious attempts to smash reality without concern for anything or anyone that would appear to pose a contradiction to its point of view. 
Join or we destroy you. Join or you will be killed. Forgiveness, on the other hand, is still in quietly and quietly does nothing. It offends no aspect of reality, nor seeks to twist it to appearances that it likes, twist its words, twist its reasoning, convince other people that they're wrong. It merely looks and waits and judges not. He who would for not forgive must judge, for he must justify his failure to forgive. And that's the typical narcissistic behavior. Narcissism is a lab label. Every human being is a narcissist to a lesser or greater extent. How do you know this? Well, you've incarnated. How narcissistic do you want to be? And we, we, the narcissist loves to say, you made me behave this way. Oh, I really loved you, but, but you forced me to hit you. I really love you, but you forced me to abandon you. I really love you, but you forced me to go and find love somewhere else. You weren't there for me. I really love you, but I just don't have time for you. But I expect you to wait for me forever because I really love you. How can you not know it? I really love you. I think about you all the time, but I don't really have time for you. That's the narcissistic behavior. Let go, let God. Just put it down. Abide in the silent stillness with no expectation. And what's meant to be will come your way. And when you've cleared the slate of unforgiveness, of unforgiven thoughts, of expectations, you'll be amazed how quickly love, which is your true self, becomes all pervading in your awareness. And of course, if it's all pervading in your awareness, it, externally, you meet the companion that matches your love because the face of your companion is the first face of God to you. Forgiveness is still and quiet and does nothing. I love you because we are love. I don't actually love you. I, I love, recognize the love we all are. And remember this. The opposite of forgiveness is judgment. Because what do we forgive? We forgive the form. What is the body? The greatest obstacle to peace. It's the denial of truth. The body tries to reinforce itself as physical. Of course, it can only do that for a hundred odd years. But it isn't true. And so it needs to perpetuate. It needs another one, the next little mini me to come along and the next me and, and propagate the species in order to keep the lie alive because this isn't true. But he who would forgive himself must learn to welcome truth exactly as it is. If you place an expectation in terms of what God is and what you are and what the self is. And you've heard me say before, if you're expecting enlightenment and it's going to be this blissful experience, you're not going to walk through walls like the men who stare at goats and turn Jack Daniels into whiskey and Coca-Cola into wine and heal the sick and heal the blind and, and earn a million bucks. You're in for a hard time. Very often people want enlightenment because they, they want to apply what they think enlightenment is to their dream. Oh, if I become awake and I become aware of being aware, I can now use it like the law of attraction to attract the life I want to have, to attract the perfect partner, the perfect job, the perfect house. Once you become awareness itself, once you become the awareness of being awareness itself, you'll want for nothing. For awareness is the love, the joy, the happiness, which is God. So let me reinforce this line. He would not forgive, must judge. For he must justify his failure to forgive. And so he's judging. You did me wrong. The world did me wrong. I was born this. I didn't have an opportunity. I'm this color, that sex, this tight, this fat, this skinny, this whatever, not so intelligent. You don't require any understanding, any learning, any book, any ritual to become aware of being aware. You simply have to be still. And the all-pervading awareness, which you are, will make itself known as soon as you've let all your unforgiven thoughts go. He who would forgive himself must learn to welcome the truth 
exactly as it is. Exactly as it is. Silently still. Do nothing then. And let forgiveness, as you abide in silent stillness, show you what to do through him, your holy self, who is your guide, your savior and protector, your holy self, which is the Christ, your holy self, which is your true self. Savior and protector, because it saves you when you become yourself knowingly from ever having to live out the delusions of the universe dream. Because it's strong in hope and certain in total clarity of your ultimate success. When, when Jesus calls upon us to say, 2,000 years ago, he said, be thyself knowingly. And you find it in the temples of Apollo. Um, you find it in many of the wonderful Greek temples and Roman temples around the world. Be thyself knowingly. When you truly know thyself. It's like, seek ye first the kingdom, and all else shall be given you. What is all else? There's only one thing that's given you. The joy of being thyself knowingly. The joy of being the extension, the eternal permanent extension, perpetual joy of God. Because what is your guide? The memory of God, your true self. What saves you? The knowing of your true self. And what is true certainty and complete clarity? The knowing of your true self, nothing else. You can't know God until you know self, because self and God are one. But you have a step to go. Be thyself knowingly and be the extension of God knowingly. The self has forgiven you because the self knows not of illusions. And the dreamer knows not of reality. You don't awaken. You let go of the obstacles to peace and when peace becomes you you know what is awakened the self is always awake the fragment the fractured the projection the body mind dissolves in the light of that which dreams awakening as the dreamer awakens the characters in the dream dissolve you go to sleep every night you dream every night you wake up in the morning when the light hits your face what happens to the characters in your dream they dissolve as you awaken and step out of your bed as the Christ self, the extension, God's son awakens to self, what happens to the characters, all 8 billion of us on this planet, all nine, 9 septillion us throughout the universe, what happens to the whole universe? It dissolves as the light of awareness is awoken in the Christ mind, which is the extension of God's eternal loving mind. Now you share his function in this knowing and forgive whom he has saved, whose sinlessness he sees, and whom he honors as the son of God. Now you forgive yourself. Now you know you're forgiven. You simply had a dream where nothing happened. Be you that. Be you that knowingly. And be wary of the temptation for false forgiveness. To, to see yourself as that, that special person that forgives others. Or to say, I'm sorry, but. No, no, I'm sorry, no, but. But is the thing you sit on. There's no but. I'm sorry. I'm truly sorry. And then change your behavior to prove that you're sorry. And how many times must someone forgive you if you keep abusing them, if you keep lying to them, if you keep denying them, if you keep rejecting them, if you abandon them all the time? How many times before they go, I forgive you and I forget you? Be wary of that. Be vigilant for that. Be wary of false forgiveness. Religion is filled with it. Spirituality is filled with false forgiveness. The grandiosity of false forgiveness. If you're truly sorry, your behavior has changed. You don't even have to utter the words. You demonstrate by your beingness. This is a plane of demonstration. Don't tell people how enlightened you are. Don't tell people how loving you are, how charitable you are. Demonstrate it through your being. Don't tell people how much you care about them, how much you think about them, how much you love them. Be present with them. This is a plane of demonstration. What's the distance between you and God? What's the distance between you and yourself? There is no distance. Now you want to interpose a distance between you and those you love. You want to go hide in a cave, but you love them. 
You have responsibilities. You chose this. Yes, this is a dream. This isn't real. But you chose to be loving. Show up. Be present with them. Tithing. What is giving people your tithing? It's giving them your time in presence. The gift, the presence. Be present with them. When you speak to someone, whether it be the parking guard, the petrol attendant, the, the corner, the, the person begging on the street, your boss, your colleague, your child, your spouse, be present. Don't sit and think about what's next. Be present. Be here now. Be as you are. Be the love of God and love with the love of God. God is the love with which we love God. And what are we but the extensions of God? Love, the love of God is loving each other, not abandoning it, not rejecting it, not running off and saying, I'm di disassociating, detaching from the world. You can't detach, be non-attached. It's all you. You can't say you don't care. Of course you care. It's all you. But nothing matters. So no matter what someone did, it did not matter. But to thyself be true. To the Lord God of your being be true. And if you truly love, don't allow yourself to be the rug that someone else can spit on and step on and beat up. Truly love thyself means the holy, the jihad. No, I love you. I will do anything for love, but I won't do that. I won't allow you to be ab to abuse me. I won't allow you to abandon me, to reject me, to hurt me all the time, to use cruel words, to blame me. I am love. I recognize the love you are. In love, we are one. Love is the absence of bodies. Love is the absence of distance. But in the dream, we connect. We make eye contact. We connect. Because love connects with itself. Each one of us is the face of Christ. Each one of us is the heart of God. Be you that knowingly. And watch your life trans transcend illusions, transcend suffering, and become the all-encompassing love we are. Be you that knowingly. Amen.